know, I'm not a blogger. And I wanted to pull my hair out because I had just had this amazing Thanksgiving holiday where I was seated next to my mother-in-law. Her name's Wheezy. And yes, I chose to sit next to Wheezy because I was super excited to tell her all about my new business. I was like, yeah, I just launched this new branding business. We're branding, we're taking the world by branding storm. We're branding this and branding that. You know, and I kind of left that whole dinner feeling pretty impressed with myself. I was like, yeah, I, I impressed my mother-in-law. So a couple of days later, when two of her friends walked up to me and said, Mark, Wheezy is so excited for you and your blogging business. And I'm not a blogger, right? Like, so right then I knew I was in big trouble, but I already knew I was in big trouble because no one was buying. Didn't really know why. I did everything you're supposed to do when you start a business. I went out and I got an awesome name and a .com URL, wildstory.com, that I spent a ton of money on. Paid a web developer a ton of money to build me an awesome website. And I even spent probably a whole week's worth of my time on moo.com, getting those perfect business cards with the border, you know, the ones I'm talking about, where you, you think you're going to be instantly successful when you're handing out all your business cards. But, but nothing was working. And look, I was, I was lost in a sea of sameness. I had nothing that differentiated, differentiated me from my competitors. I was staying up late at night, looking at my competitors' websites for inspiration, right? I, what was I doing? I was copying their websites because if it was working for them, it would work for me. So I was using their exact same messaging and copy. And I was uh, lowering my prices all the time to compete. And because that's the way I only thought I could, I could win any business. And so I was winning the race that nobody wants to win, which is that race to the bottom. And I, I was literally thinking of giving up on my business, of turning it in. I was like, this isn't working. So I thought back to a earlier time in my career and Damien had mentioned, you know, I was working for Oliver Stone, the Academy Award winning director. And we were in the offices in Santa Monica and young film student happened to be in that day and was interviewing Oliver. And he said, Oliver, how do you know who to cast in your movies and who not, you know, who not to cast? And Oliver, he didn't even, like, wasn't even a second. He responded right away. He was like, you know, each actor has their own unique and specific brand. So it makes it really easy to know who to choose and who not to choose. And as I was thinking about that, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I thought to myself, that's it. Like, why would anyone choose me? What's my brand? And, and I had all these like storytelling techniques. I wasn't even using them in my own business. So went back and referenced all the old Hollywood storytelling techniques and proven branding frameworks. And I rebuilt my brand from the ground up. Now. We totally stand out from our competition. I don't worry about them at all. I don't look at their websites at all for content. They're looking at me and, and asking me how we're doing what we're doing. And we have the ability to charge really high fees. We're, we're not the cheapest agency around, and, and that's the way we like it. You know, but most importantly, my mother-in-law, Wheezy, she can actually tell people what I do, which is that I run a brand strategy studio that helps businesses outmaneuver their competition. And so like, I believe that brand and brand strategy is the single greatest investment you can make in your business to charge premium rates, increase sales, and beat your competition. Now, I've been fortunate enough to work with great storytellers like the Academy Award-winning director, Oliver Stone, and Fortune 100 companies like, uh, about to, yeah, about, like Thor Industries, who's the parent to the more recognizable iconic brand Airstream, Thor being the largest RV manufacturer in the world. But most of the businesses I work with are just like yours, like business owners who have big dreams, who are willing to do what's needed to make them come true. So I want you to think a little bit about how you started your day. And I'm going to posit or put out there that every decision we make is driven by branding. From the moment we wake up, right, we decide what shirt to wear, what cup of coffee we're going to drink, what company, you know, is it Starbucks? Is it something else? Is it Dunkin'? What computer we're going to use? What browser we choose to use? 
Where do we drive that day? Where do we grocery shop? So if we think about that every decision is driven by branding, we, we got to ask, like, what is a brand? So a lot of people think, you know, uh, it might be like your identity, like a logo or something visual. A lot of people think it's a brand promise or even your beliefs and your values. But it's really the amalgamation of all those things. And so the definition that I subscribe to is from my friend and mentor, Marty Neumeyer. He's a little bit of the godfather of, of branding. And he says it's the gut feeling a person has about your products or services, which is really interesting, right? Because if it's a gut feeling. It's something that we don't totally control. We can influence it. We, can, we do a lot to try to, to help influence that gut feeling, but we really don't control it once it's out there. And the thing about a brand, right, is it has a job. It's not, and that job isn't to look good or to be cool hats. It's really to get more people to buy more stuff for more years at a higher price, right? So that's the job of a brand. If, if, if your brand's not doing this, it's not doing its job because brand is all about selling. If you don't believe me, one of the greatest figures that we all know and many of us love, Santa Claus, never looked like this until the 1930s, until the great copywriter and advertiser, Adon Bloom was doing some work for Coca-Cola. And he took a bunch of visions of this mythological entity who's now called Santa Claus, but it was Kris Kringle and St. Nick and all these other names from all these other countries. He wasn't dressed in a beautiful red coat with white trim and rosy cheeks in the Coca-Cola colors until the 1930s. And so using brand and the ability of brand to sell carbonated sugar water if that doesn't convince you, nothing will. Wait a minute. Now, when uh, we think about me, a business, right? Yeah. Let me ask a clarifying question here. Is that how Santa Claus became the, the big guy with the white beard, with the red coat and the black belt was because of Coca-Cola advertising? I don't want to make you sad, but yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. So when you think about a company of any kind, right? We have certain costs to produce our product. And then there's a generally accepted price that we're allowed to charge for our product. And that's where we get our margin. That's how we actually make money. And then there's, on top of price, sometimes there's perceived value. And so when you think of how we can influence this margin block, and either stretch it or, well, I guess it would be stretch it or <laughs> compress it. We can either continue to lower our costs. We can continue to lower or raise our price. But typically, if there's a understanding of what a product should cost, like let's say a cup of coffee, then the only way we can raise that price is through perceived value, right? So we can grow our revenues through volume or we can charge more, right? And when you start to think about your different strategy by increasing that perceived value, that price line and that perceived value, right, will move up. And get more margin. And so brand is all about increasing the value of a relationship. We want to close that gap between our ideal customer and our business. We have all these customers out there and we want them to know about our business. And the way we do that is by providing meaning, right? Because today, because meaning is today's marketing. I want you to think about this little sentence. I'm a blank person. 
And how often do you potentially say that I may, well, I'm drinking Topo Chico today, so I'm a Topo Chico person, or I'm just like picking things up off my desk. I'm a Warby Parker person, or I'm a Tesla person, or a Jeep person, or a Volcom person, right? And so when we think about how we bring people into our companies and our brands, it all starts with awareness. And if we do a good job, they'll purchase. We want them to come back and purchase again. And if we're lucky, they'll recommend and influence. And then if we're really lucky, we'll get to the pinnacle of brand building, which is my computer moving slowly. <laughs> Just a second. Here we go. Right? And they're going to say, I'm a your brand person. And I want you to think about that. So what does that look like? Like, for example, me. These are all the brands that I affiliate with. I'm going to go ahead while this is going. I'm going to run in this through uh, Ecamm. I'm going to do something a little different here. You should be able to see that. And that is, that is all the brands that I identify with. So I, I want you to think about all, all the brands that you identify with. Yeah, Damien? I said I knew you were an Apple guy. Yeah, of course. Except, you know, now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's th throwing it, you know, in my face. Let me just make sure that, um, oh, that's why it's not showing. Great. We should be smooth now. Cool. All right. Sorry about that little technical thing. The problem, right, is we're living in this super competitive age. You know, it's one thing for me to say, oh, be, you know, have everyone love your brand. I want to tell you a little story. So this is a brand that I personally love. It's called Peak Design. And Peak Design makes really cool camera bags. Uh, they make all sorts of things, tripods, things like that. But this is their flagship pro product. It's called uh, the Peak Design Slim. And just about a sling. And just about a month ago, Amazon came out with a sling that looked exactly like this. Now, they call theirs the everyday sling. Amazon calls theirs the Amazon Basics everyday sling. Peak Design sells it for $150, and Amazon sells it for $30. Mm -hmm. So the only thing, and this story is still yet to, to play out, that's defensible from Peak Design at this point, because certainly that Amazon bag doesn't carry a camera any differently. Looks like to be almost the same exact fabric to me. Looks a little different. But the only thing that's defensible is the brand, is that gut feeling that their community has about that product keeps showing up and purchasing. And that's because we're living in this crazy age of ubiquity where there's really not very much differentiation between products. Like these cars without their logo, very difficult to know which one's different and why. I mean, even like a phone, you know, there's really nothing different between my phone, which is a Apple phone and a Samsung phone. Like they do the same thing. So branding comes into play to help us make a choice. Making matters even a little more complicated in the average US household, there are two phones, two computers, a smart TV, an iPad, a connected TV box of some sort, a smart speaker like an Alexa, a gaming console, a smart watch, and a VR console, all bombarding us with information, different advertising messages, different stimuli for our attention. So like, how do you even stand out and get noticed in today's world? How do we actually even make a decision anymore? I want you to think about if you go in front of like a, go to a convenience store because you're thirsty and you want to get some water, you stand in front of the cooler and you're faced with these three choices. You got to have Voss. It's prettier. You got it. Yeah. But let, let me ask you why. Because Voss commands a premium for that product, right? Because I'm an idiot. Tastes exactly the same. Oh, yeah. And I'm an idiot, too, because I love liquid death. I think they're crushing it in the water. They've got water in a can, heavy metal water in a can. 
I've, I've blind t- taste tested all of these. They, you can't tell the difference. There's no discernible difference between any of this water, but they all have marketable positions. But so here's the good news. It's that Fuji bottle gets me all the time. Oh, me too. I was just in the airport, that square bottle, that packaging. It's <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, that's going to be the best water possible. But the good news is that, you know, our brains haven't evolved all that much over the years and we're really hardwired to notice what's different. So a lot of people will talk about how we're hardwired to have noticed what's different for fight and flight, but I would contend that we're hardwired to know it's different because that's all things that like are good for us. Like when we see a red apple in a tree, we're like, that looks good. I I want that apple over all, all the green ones. And speaking of apples, we're not going to be talking about apple in today's presentation because everybody talks about apple. And yes, is it pretty easy to cite the world's greatest brand as a brand example? Yes. But how's that totally relevant to you, you know, everyone is spending so much time trying to think different that nobody's thinking differently. I want you not to be an apple. I want you to be you. I want you to be yourselves. I want you to think of yourself as an orange. You know, so we've talked a lot about branding theory and a lot of people think it's complicated, but I'm here to demystify that. You know, I, I, a lot of people try to hold it you know, the, the secret behind the back and they don't want to let you know how this is done, but I think it's as easy as one, two, three, we have a three-step process. Our first process is differentiate, translate and communicate. I'm going to cover all these and, and go through those. So another great thing about this differentiation stage, this is our strategy stage. And does this look like anybody's brain on the left? Anyone ever feel like that sometimes? The great news is it's a process that's designed, a framework that's designed, because you have all the answers, to take all the answers out of your head and put them into a nice, controlled, organized framework. So the first mistake I see most businesses making with their businesses is that they rush to execute tactics, right? The first thing they say is, I need to fix my website, I need to fix my social, I need a new logo, I need a new name. But our number one tenant here at Wild Story is it must start with strategy. Okay. Now, for us, brand strategy is a long-term plan to outmaneuver your competitors through differentiation. I want you to think about that for a second. How powerful that would be if you had a long-term plan to outmaneuver competitors through differentiation. And why even start here? Well, we're seeing all sorts of data. This is from Gartner. This is from like a real source, not someone who, you know, is, uh, it's not some made up data. That 33% of CMOs cite that brand strategy as their most vital marketing capability, even more important than analytics. Now, someone who's always been chasing those who are specializing in analytics, this brings a smile to my face. But what I want you to understand here is that this is how big brands are starting to see the landscape. And most tactical issues, the reason we rush out and say, I need a new website, a logo, a new business card, most tactical issues in our marketing are typically brand and brand strategy issues. And they can appear in a business's life cycle at any time. So to think that You know, it's not just about rebranding or refreshing. It's about applying branding to your brand throughout the life cycle. Doesn't this ever sound familiar in your business? Someone comes in and you're working on an execution, maybe a website. It's like, I don't like it. Don't even know where to start telling my story or where to like what to write on social. We don't know who we are. We're not resonating with our target market. What do we sound like? You know, you're sitting in front of a computer and you, you got to write an ad. Our website's not working. Social media could be better, I hear all the time. We don't know how to tell our mother in law at Thanksgiving and what we do. Okay. We're completely inconsistent across all our touch points. So we start with strategy because we need a plan that's articulated 
document and shared. And this plan defines who we are, who we're for, and why anyone should care. This allows us to show up consistently. You know, uh, I just posted a Instagram carousel, I think the other day, that the title was the inconsistencies uh, and are the cracks in your hull that are going to sink your ship eventually. So we want to show up consistently. Really quickly, in this first phase, in this differentiate phase, this is our seven-step process. These are the questions that you need to answer in this phase. Why are we here? What do we do and how? What makes us different? Who are we here for? What's our backstory? What do we value most and what's our personality? Given the time we have today, I'm just going to cover what makes us different and give you a tool that will allow you to do that. So mistake number two, just like I did in the beginning, most brands choose to swim in the sea of sameness. They look at their competitors and they're like, if it's working for them, it'll work for me. I'm just going to do exactly what they do. We really need to be thinking about how we can be different. So this is my friend, Tim Parr. Tim's a really cool guy. He's, a, he's an old surfer, touring bluegrass musician and entrepreneur. And Tim's getting a little older. And Tim walked into his local CVS in Northern California, and he went to go buy some readers. And he was faced with a display that looks just like this. And the way he tells the story, he was standing there dumbfounded, kind of kind of in analysis paralysis mode because he didn't know which ones to buy because none of them looked like his. And he started to think there's no readers for someone like me who perceives themselves as being cool. Not to mention all these readers are like five, 10 bucks. So Tim went on to start a company called Caddis, which makes readers, rock and roll readers for aging musicians, artists, action sports, athletes, their company's growing like crazy. Their readers sell from $90 to $120 per pair when you can go to Walmart and get readers that have no discernible functional difference for 5 to $10 a pair. The way Tim did this was by finding the white space. And so you can do this on a whiteboard. You can do this on a PowerPoint. But you can just build a simple two-by-two two axis, and you can start to map out different criteria and categories that your customers use to make purchasing decisions. So, you know, Tim went through and he was like, hey, people think about price, edginess. I, you know, I think we can have a opportunity if we're super edgy and we can charge a premium. All our competitors are in the lower left-hand corner. And for those of you that want to make a lot of money, makes no it's no secret that you want to be in the upper upper right corner, typically, on the quadrant. Here's another client we work with. Super cool. It's called Stoke Broker. They do ultra high-end travel to really cool destinations. But they don't really sell anything. They're kind of like a travel agent. So it's not like they have, like, a lot that they can defend or a lot in their secret sauce. So when we started working with them, we did this exact same thing. We went and we mapped out, and, and, and what's really cool is like these, these are just logos that we screen captured and move, you can move around and have conversation and move, and it was like physical adventure and luxury and hospitality, and we found that this idea of that they provide physical adventure that's high luxury was no one was really doing it, so it was a really big opportunity, and that's their logo. Now, I'm going to give you a little pro tip. I don't think I've ever started doing this with a client or anyone and nailed it on the first try. So do a few, you play with the axes, you find different attributes. There can be a lot of right answers in this exercise, but you're gonna have this recording. I've put all these axes inspiration ideas for you and your business, and you can start to build your own two by two. And you can start to think, well, hey, is certainty one of the axes that we can play with is being experimental or findability or that we're a guide or a mentor, you know, how fast we, we work. And these are ways that you can start to differentiate really easy from your competitors. 
So once you get through that first phase, that brand strategy phase, this is the phase that most people associate with branding. And we need to translate this into some really great design. Because great strategy without great design will fall flat and vice versa, right? Great design without great strategy becomes meaningless. And I, I think of design, I think of identity as the visual, the words, video, any form of foundational communication, core stories, core messaging. And so mistake number three is not linking strategy to design and vice versa. This is where we just run out and we're like, hey, I'm going to hire someone on Upwork. Or I'm just going to get my friend to do a logo and we're going to get something out and ship it. And by the way, which is really important to do when you first start your business, I'm not sitting here saying that anybody, if you're just trying to figure it out and you got to like see if your business even makes sense, yeah, you got to like see if there's even a market for what you're doing. But once you've proved and validated what you're doing, then you really need to be thinking about linking your brand strategy to your communications. So this is the business enterprise of a friend of mine, Greg Mezu, and Greg owns Single Track Trails, and this is what their businesses look like. And Single Track Trails, the core part of Single Track Trails is they build mountain bike trails all across the world. Uh, they build in public partner partnerships, public private partnerships. Um, they they build for uh, private folks uh, all over all over the U.S. and um, and into Canada. And so if you've been on a mountain bike trail in North Carolina, Colorado, you've good chance you've been on one of their trails. And they did exactly the same thing. They had to get in business for some of their businesses. But when Greg was launching his new business called Backslope Tools, he came to me and he said, look, I want to do it right this time. I know how painful it's been trying to work with this identity. Try, we have not, no rhyme or reason. It, it doesn't work. They don't reproduce well. And so we took Greg through the, the branding process and we did a lot of uh, research and, and insights and we came up with a lot of things for Greg and we started then designing around a lot of these attributes that they were pro-grade and reliable and trustworthy. You can kind of see some of these sketches. And we were able to even embed the final mark with something that's actually called a backslope. So you may never know that this Mark is communicating something super authentic, but their customers certainly well, because the customers are super detail oriented. They're super prideful about what they do. And they know that that's the proper angle of a backslope and this really strong mark that was inspired by mountains, trail building, and even looks a little bit like a bee. This is their final identity. And then you get to go on and do a lot of things and think about hey, when we designed this identity, we knew it would have to be on a tool handle. We knew that there were probably going to be people wearing hoodies. But the most important output of this whole part of our relationship with Greg in this phase was coming up with the dedicated style and brand guide. Because that dedicated style and brand guide becomes a tool where you can now use this within your team so internally, you can have a agreed upon nomenclature, but externally, as you work with ad partners, as you work with website you know, developers and, and designers, and you work with people helping you create content, you can be consistent and return back to it. Now, as you get into this phase, right, I want you to be armed with some more tools so that you can get exactly what you want, because I've seen so many people get into the design and the identity phase and end up wasting so much money because they can't communicate with creatives. Because the thing about creatives is just like you might be in your profession, we're super nerdy about what we do. And all we want to do is help you out and give you exactly what you need. But a lot of times it's kind of like we're speaking two different languages, right? And what you're saying isn't what we're hearing. And I want you to be super successful. Like there's like this weird kind of game of telephone. Like when you say something like, can you make this bigger? What we hear is I'm just trying to upset you, but, we, but I know that you just mean, I wonder what this image would look like if it were more prominent. 
You might even say, I hate that when we present something to you. But what a creator, because they're sensitive, is going to hear is, I hate you. But all you really mean is like, can you explain this to me? It's not quite landing for me. And sometimes you might even say, we want it to look like this. And uh, all our creatives hearing is, why don't you just copy this other thing? You know, there's, there's nothing here. And all you're really meaning is, here are a few examples of work we like and think is relevant. So good feedback is a gift. And I want you to be able to give good feedback because if you give good feedback, your creative team, whether it's a writer, whether you're writing copy, design, they're going to be able to give you exactly what you want. And the wonderful Brene Brown says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So how do we give good feedback? It's pretty simple. We just want to be clear, concise, and constructive with our words. So you might not want to say, can you make the logo bigger? You might want to say just something like, I can't tell if this artwork is my brand or one of our competitors. Now, I'm not a designer but I have it on firsthand knowledge that the one thing, if you actually want to mess around with the designer and you want to drive them crazy, say this, it doesn't pop. Say, you know, if you want to get them to actually do something for you, tell them the call to actions aren't clear. And, you know, just be honest with them. Tell them it looks like it's really off brand. It doesn't reference the style guide. That's where that style guide is a great tool to refer back to. And one of my favorite all-time ones, because I work with a lot of outdoor brands, they always want to tell me how much exposure they can get us. Just say like, hey, this is how much we'll pay. We, we hope it works for you. And that's actually a good tip with people just in general. I find it works really well um, with a lot of people we work with. And then lastly, a really great I, framework if you want to forget I, all of that. Just I try using it. Because all of that What's stuff, that, Damien? All that stuff you said about don't say to designers, I think I've said it all once or twice, except that last one. That last one doesn't apply, but all the rest of it, it doesn't pop. How many times I've said that to my team? Now, my team's great, and I, I applaud them all the time, but as you were going through that, I'm like, oof. I'm like, oof. Yeah. I also like this framework quite a bit. I notice I wonder. So you can say something, Damien, instead of it doesn't pop. Say, hey, I notice that you chose an interesting color of red. I wonder what it would look like if we did a little bit more of a hot pink. Yeah, right? T totally disarms everything, makes it easy. Also makes it like you can just, you know, if you get in with I notice and you end with I wonder, you'll be in good shape. But when in doubt, as you're giving creative feedback, just always return back to the business goal. There's always a reason that we're investing in creative work. Let's always bring it back the business goal. And I just want to be really clear too that, look, this is not a one-way street. You have a lot of expectations from your creative team. And if you're working with anybody, they should be number one concerned about your ROI. So that's your budget as it relates to your business goals. They need to follow both your brand guidelines, but also they need to listen to what you want. You are the client. So don't let any creatives push you around or, you know, if your gut feeling is telling you to go a certain way, they should work with you on that. But most importantly, they should be really focused on solving your business problems.